The Canadian military cemetery at Beni sur Mer in northwestern France is just a few kilometers from the Normandy coast. On a clear summer's day, standing among the headstones, you can see the water and the beaches. The same beaches where hundreds of young Canadian boys were cut down by German guns on June 6, 1944, D-Day. Many of them had only been out of the landing craft that had brought them across the English Channel for a few desperate seconds. They were strafed and lay dying in the blood and sand and would never know that they had helped spearhead one of Canada's greatest military accomplishments. Our country's dead from the Normandy campaign totaled more than 2,000 lads. Now they lie in the ground at Beni sur mer It's a quiet, peaceful place, a beautiful cemetery lined with Canadian maple trees, a piece of Canada almost hidden in a tiny corner of another country. What do we call those men? We call them heroes. Now, keep that image in the back of your mind and come with me to another very different front. The Olympic Hockey Arena in Sochi, Russia in 2014. Canada's formidable women's hockey team, winners of the previous four gold medals, was down 2-0 to their arch-rival, the United States, and there was less than four minutes to play. The end of an era was looming. But no, that's not what happened. With three minutes and 26 seconds left to play, Canada's Brianne Jenner scored when the puck bounced off her leg and into the American net. Then, with less than a minute left, 54.6 seconds to be exact, Marie-Philippe Poulain scored to tie the game. The unbelievable had happened. A tie is not a win. It was on to overtime. And when Canada picked up an early penalty, the nation feared the comeback was over. But again, no, the fairy tale was not to be crushed. At 8.10 into overtime, Poulain took a pass to the side of the net and blasted it home. So what do we call those women? Actually, we call them heroes, too. Those are two very different examples of what being a hero is. And no, I'm not suggesting that we are abusing the word by equating war and sports. What I'm trying to suggest is that hero is a description that covers a wide range of possibilities, and there are a lot of stories that fall in that space between dying for your country and winning for your country. That's what this book is about. It's about people who have put the lives of Canadians of all walks of life first. That's what being a hero means to me. We've all witnessed extraordinary Canadians very recently. Many of them. They're the frontline healthcare workers who risked everything to be there for us in the battle against COVID-19. Doctors, nurses, hospital staff, first responders at police, fire and paramedic stations, grocery store clerks, truck drivers, farmers, postal workers. The list is long, and we must never forget them. While we did our part by staying at home, they defined extraordinary by leaving their families every day and being on the job for us. One of the stories in the pages ahead will capture just one example of these most recent Canadian heroes. Before I started writing, people used to ask me, Who's your hero, Peter? I never hesitated. As a baby boomer, so much of my youth was spent revering what Tom Brokaw calls the greatest generation, the one that preceded mine. So, of course, my father, a veteran himself, was often front and center in my stories. But so was a lad from Winnipeg by the name of Andrew Monarski. On a June night in 1944, Monarski, a mid-upper gunner on a Lancaster bomber, joined his fellow crew members on board their plane for a mission over the continent. It was supposed to be routine, but it wasn't. Once they were over the target, they were first hit by flak and then attacked by a German night fighter. 
with the plane crippled, listing from side to side and plummeting towards earth, the pilot ordered everyone to jump. One after another, they bailed out until Monarski stood alone at the doorway. He looked back and saw the tail gunner, Pat Brophy, trapped in his tiny, cramped position. Monarski abandoned his jump and crawled back through the burning wreckage to help his buddy. With his clothes and his parachute pack on fire, he pushed and pulled as best he could, but nothing worked. Finally, Brophy yelled at him to save himself, to jump. Monarski refused, but Brophy insisted. Monarski went back to the door, looked at Brophy, saluted, and said, Good night, sir, and then he jumped. Andrew Monarski didn't survive the night. By a miracle, Pat Brophy did. Many years later, I met Brophy while I was on assignment in northern Ontario, where he was living at the time. As I listened to his story, I got chills. Even today, it makes me tear up. But his story also made me realize that if Pat Brophy hadn't survived that night, no one would ever have learned about Andrew Monarski's heroism. Because they did, Monarski was awarded the country's highest medal for bravery, the Victoria Cross. His story became a heritage minute. A school was named after him. Andrew Monarski and the other people I've mentioned in this foreword were just ordinary Canadians, everyday Canadians, if you will. They came from different provinces, communities, and backgrounds, but they became extraordinary through their actions. When Mark Bulgich and I set out to write this book with the keen advice of our editor, Simon & Schuster's Sarah St. Pierre, we decided we wanted to write each story in the voice of the person we were profiling. We interviewed each person at length, for hours at times, to capture their experiences in detail. They shared everything. Their stories will take you across the country and around the world. They'll draw on your emotions, sensibilities, and experiences. They'll make you laugh and cry. They'll make you think about the real meaning of the words extraordinary and hero. Their lives may not result in medals, heritage minutes, or new names for schools, but then again, they might. <laughs>